Welcome to Thunder Nerds. I'm Brian Hinton. I'm Sarah Veslock. And I'm Frederick Philip von Weiss. And thank you so much for consuming the Thunder Nerds, a conversation with the people behind the technology that love what they do. <laughs> and do tech good. good. Pow. <laughs> Sarah, yeah. Sarah. Was I supposed to say something? I'm just, I don't do that. That's you guys. I don't do that. No, no. Uh -uh. Anyway, thanks everybody for joining the show. Brian, why don't you take us off? Yeah, uh, do, we have an uh, excellent sponsor for the season. Um, and uh, do you know what I care about? Well, I care about my identity. Uh, it's mine and I don't want anyone else to have it. Do you know who else cares about identity? Why that's our episode sponsor, Off Zero. Yeah. Uh, they make it easy for developers to set up authentication, and it doesn't matter if you're building a web app, a native app, mobile app, they have the tools you need to get going quickly. Uh, and if you want to try it out, just go to authzero.com today. Nice, oh, Sarah. That's my cue. I remembered this time. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know about the last one. All right. So everybody, uh, please, please uh, subscribe to the show on YouTube. You'll be the first to know when a show comes out and even get to see all of our bloopers. Um, although I think they're seeing them right now. So I don't know if that's a really big bonus, but, but <laughs> Those subscribe will be cut out unless they're watching live. <laughs> subscribe on YouTube. Frederick. Thanks, Sarah. So let's go ahead and welcome our guest. We have a excellent human being. We're very lucky to have her back. We have avid rock climber and developer experience engineer, Divya Tagtashian. Welcome to the show. Hello, happy to be welcome. back. Yeah, we're like so happy to have videos, you. I think, I think, yeah, something like that. Yeah, I think it was at um, uh, ViewConf, right? Yeah, ViewConf yeah. 2019. Yep. Was it 19? Yeah, yeah. so a year. Yeah, it was okay. Year. Feels longer somehow. Well, I think it was like in yeah. February or January, like it was like legitimately <laughs> A yeah, it was in year, I believe. It was in March in Tampa. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Yeah, that's right. At the Straz Performing Arts Center. Yeah. That's yeah. The one. Yeah. Good job. Ah, look at that yeah, memory. Not, not <laughs> bad. It all finally clicked back together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We you were given a talk on um, I think it was like something about semantic input masks. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's cool. So yeah. hey, um, thanks. Like I said, thanks for joining us. You're joining sure. us from Chicago, right? Yep, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. How how are you doing over there? I know we you know we briefly talked about this before we started recording, but for our, our yeah. audience, how how is it in Chicago right now? What's the uh, environment? It's it's pretty it's pretty all right. I think people are dealing. So they um, similar to a lot of big cities, they closed a lot of restaurants and bars for dining in. Um, and so you essentially can only do takeout at the, at this moment, which is nice because restaurants can somehow sort of float their business that way through takeout as much as possible. Um, and I don't know if this is a known thing, but people in Chicago really like their food a lot, <laughs> a lot. And so um, there's this uh, website that uh, curates for like, like fine dining experience called Talk, and they create it a thing called talk to go essentially they have the very like fine dining restaurants are on there so you you'd reserve it's called kind of like resi or open table but more for like upscale and so they opened up like a, a feature called talk to go so fancy dining restaurants have to go options so alinea is like one of the top restaurants in, Ch in the u.s i think um the world actually i think but it's three michelin stars and they have a to-go option. Generally, it's like you would pay three hundred to five hundred dollars or upwards of that just to just to dine in. And now you can do takeout for forty dollars a person <laughs> or something crazy like that. So it's just like it's funny to see. I mean, it's really nice to see people like kind of offering these options and people in Chicago supporting those kinds of businesses. Um, but yeah, it, it is it is funny to see just like in general people just wanting fancy food even in times of crisis and that being a priority so yeah I think people are dealing as long as you're able to still get takeout I think there's there's rumors that there'll be a shelter in place um, because a suburb of Chicago has had a sh Oak Park has instituted a shelter in place and so Chicago might at some point maybe this week we'll see but mm -hmm. for now I think you can still go out and do whatever you need 
but I think people are generally still self quarantining. Yeah. Well, everybody wants some normalcy to make them feel better. And somehow, maybe, you know, maybe yeah. it's that three star Michelin restaurant where you're like, well, shit, at least I got a lobster tail from this guy. And I exactly. feel so much better. Like I could, oh, okay, everything's going to be okay. You know? Yeah. We'll some probably normalcy. have a lot of that in the next few months. Probably. I mean, we'll see what the new normal is. I feel like it's constantly changing because I think two weeks ago was when I tried, I canceled a lot of my travel and conference plans. And I think at that time, I felt like I was pretty late to canceling things, but I was still early if you think about the grand scheme of things, because I often had like airlines and conferences kind of insinuate that I was being paranoid. <laughs> um, and then two weeks pass by and everything is like shutting down. And I'm just like, wow, this is a lot happens within such a short period of time. And it's quite, quite crazy. I think this is going to be likely a defining moment in our generation or like generations to come which is kind of a scary thing to think about but still we're still not at the numbers of the uh, of like the spanish flu but it might get there at some point we'll see because i think the spanish flu is like what 50 million people in a year died? yeah 50 million yeah. people died and so um yeah i don't know what this is going to be like in, in a year so hopefully we'll be smart about it and everybody will do the, uh, what did the gentleman I heard the doctor to say today? He didn't say social distancing was a, the right term because we want to keep socializing digitally, but we want to literally distance and keep a good distance away from each other. And hopefully right. with that, we could mitigate a lot of this contamination and move yeah. forward. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, it's like a sobering time for sure. Um, but I'm hoping that I, I think people will find the new normal and like operate within that. Cause I think we're still in the moment where people are in shock and trying to deal with what's happening around them. Um, yeah, unfortunately this is like the new normal yeah. for now, but I think like in a sense, there's like joy and there's happiness in it as well in terms of like seeing people's work from home setups and realizing that we're all figuring this out together. So you're not so alone as you think you are. Yeah, and I hope people will remember to, you know, still buy from those local restaurants that they really love, like all across the country, and to, like buy yeah. from the shops you like. Like, I think I've saw a bunch of people online on, um, like small vendors like Ugg Monk, uh, talking about how they're not getting orders and they're wondering how they're going to get through this. And so, yeah, yeah, Bro, this thing will pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's hope. We'll, yeah, optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be optimistic and say make it it's going to pass. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it does more harm if we don't believe that and if we oh, don't sure, yeah. be responsible yeah, exactly. and communicate that. Yeah. But before we jump more into uh, this kind of uh, realm, uh, which we definitely should spend some more time in, why don't we talk a little bit about you and uh, have our audience yeah. get to know you? Why don't you tell us a little bit about you? What, For example, where did you go to university? You went to two universities, right? Yeah, so I did. Uh, I so I'm officially I officially graduated from one university, but I went to multiple. So I officially graduated from a small liberal arts school called Clark. It's in Massachusetts. It's pretty small, very small. Um, and that was sort of the reason I moved to the U.S. I'm not originally from here, um, oh. and so I moved to the U.S. to go to college there because they had a really good program, uh, like a scholarship program for international students. Because most liberal arts schools and small schools don't offer scholarships. So I went there for that purpose. And um, while I was there, so the nice thing about the US is that when you're enrolled in a college, you can do cross registration. So if there's a college nearby, you can cross register there and take classes there. So it gives you the ability to widen your class and like the courses offered. So you're not limited to only the college you go to. And I realized that in like sophomore year, which was really cool. <laughs> So I just ended up taking classes at other colleges. So like my school is really small. And so the computer science department was not very, was not very fleshed out. And also like classes weren't, uh, like there weren't a lot of offerings and they were taught in a very different way versus like a school that's more technical focused. And so um, there was a polytechnic really close to where I went to school called WPI. And it's a great polytechnic school, like Worcester Polytechnic, it's a really great school. And so I would take computer science and game development classes there, mainly because they had like a better curriculum, more course offerings, the professors were way better, um, just because of the fact that they would bring in like 
such talented students there. So I had the opportunity to do that without having, without like formally enrolling, which is really cool. Um, also, I was able to like, because I was taking classes at multiple places, graduate early. So I like played the system a little, <laughs> like essentially uh, I was on semesters and polytechnics are on quarters. So I could like stack up classes and take more classes in a semester than I was supposed to. It's like a loophole. So I graduated <laughs> earlier than I was <laughs> supposed to. They were, they were not happy with me for doing that, but it's fine. Yeah. How, 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 how much earlier? Uh, it was about a, a year earlier or like wow. half a semester earlier. Um, you. Yeah, so I, I took, I ended up taking more classes than I needed to, um, mainly just to keep student status. That was like a thing that I needed to do, but I could become a part-time student. So you're paying less than a full-time student. And so you just like, I, I had to, as a student, find loopholes to do things I wanted to do. So I, I'm not like, <laughs> I think it's, I'm pretty, uh, unconventional in that sense because I went to school and then I did my own thing I designed my own major uh, because I wanted to take all these classes and do what I wanted um, which also gave me the flexibility to build my skills with uh, like web development because that's something I really enjoyed and I loved it so much um, and computer science unfortunately didn't allow me to focus on that it's like very different from web development and I knew that's what I wanted to do so I essentially just programmed my school around giving myself the time to to focus on that so that I can like drive towards that goal yeah hey, yeah good why, for you to like do that yeah why did you uh know you wanted to do web de development what like drew you to it yeah so I um I built websites for fun for a while like since high school um or even before I did like flash and stuff but then I oh. started building WordPress sites. <laughs> it was yeah. terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and Dreamweaver and like all that kind of stuff. Um, but I built sites in WordPress and that's how I would get like pocket money essentially when I was in college and never realized that that was a job because I just assumed that programmers didn't build websites or I, I don't know, like mentally it didn't click for mm. me uh, until like sophomore year when I started going to tech meetups and I was like, oh, people actually do this for work. And I think that was the first time, like sophomore year, when I heard someone use the term front-end developer. And I was like, that's what I am. And that's like what I want to do. Um, and then from there, it was just like trying to chart a path towards like officially, professionally doing that. Yeah. Did you want to do design as well? Because I think I saw you had a, a Behance. A Behance, I don't know how yeah, you say that. Word, I right? but yeah, I did. Yeah. Looked like you were doing like the design road a little bit. Yeah, so I was doing both, like essentially. Um, so I think when you when I started out, this was like in 2011 and 12, I assumed that you would have to pick a path, like it's a designer or developer. And the hybrid role for me seemed to not exist or it just in my head didn't exist, that you had to pick a path and developers were more like back end and you would do like, build servers and whatever else and to me that was not as interesting as building for the front end and so I assumed that I had to have more like design chops for that so I essentially was doing like html css javascript but also design because I was like I have to do this path it felt like a path that made the most sense for me um and then realized like I'm not as good a designer <laughs> as a lot of other people out there because I'm self-taught like I just taught myself a bunch of stuff and figured it out as I went but yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of us have that. Sarah, you had kind of a similar path where you were building some sites and you started uh, saying, you know, what well, I'm going into development. Yeah, and I, I ended up going the different, uh, totally like your story, except the opposite, where I was like, oh, yeah. wow, you know, JavaScript and databases and like not so much. Um, so I ended up staying much more on the, on the um, design side of things. Although, Sadly, like I don't get to do the HTML and CSS the way I used to, which I really, really enjoy, but um, it's kind of, uh, you have to choose and, and I've chosen, God damn it. No. <laughs> you can never go back. I can never go back. <laughs> you can still go back. I do. I go back all the time. I just don't tell anybody, you know? Yeah. I think it's, um, <laughs> it's interesting to see just the trajectory. I, I'm actually enjoying that trajectory of like, I would say maybe like five or six years ago, if you did HTML and CSS, you were not considered as important or 
you were people didn't actually respect what you did <laughs> compared yeah. to someone who like did something in rails or python or c sharp or whatever else um and that was really frustrating and i think that informed a lot of decisions i made because i was like oh i don't want to do css because if i did css people assume mm. i wasn't as good a developer yep. um which is like really frustrating and i think now we're at a point where the expectation is that if you are a developer specifically a front end person you have the ability to do css and javascript and you can hop back and forth i think also this there's an extension of what it means to be a front end developer which is that now you can choose there's like a huge spectrum and you can choose at which end you want to live in so there's people i know who are front end developers who focus a lot on like css and svg and like animations and don't write a lot of javascript and they're still considered front end developers and then there's the other end where you're building almost back end but it's still front end because you're using graphql and all kinds of like data layers that you're building and not as much ui and that's also a front end developer role and i think chris core talked about this just like that that chasm i forget what he calls it it's just like this chasm that's happening within front end where it's almost like two different roles are emerging from this spectrum because those two people even though they're essentially in the same role they do different things yeah yeah, look at uh, keyframers. Look at uh, yeah. Stephen and David Korshid. Like, like that. There, it's so. I mean, there's some JavaScript in there, mind you, but you know, they're so heavy with CSS animation. And I, I would challenge anyone to not call them developers. They're mm -hmm. at the top of their game of, of of developers. It's it's just like you said. There's there's different flavors that are emerging from that divide. I guess. Yeah, and I think for them specifically, I mean, I'm I definitely want to give a shout out to David because he's incredibly talented he knows css so well oh, yeah. and he also write, wrote like a whole javascript framework called xstate which is just like how to manage state mm. using state machine so he's just like able to go from one end of the spectrum to the other really gracefully which i think is pretty rare if you think about it like not a lot of people can do that and i feel, feel like the guys at keyframe are both like do both things <laughs> And I'm just, they're like, just, just the gold standard. I, I watch their stuff sometimes and I'm like, how on earth? It's just amazing. amazing. And he plays piano. I know. <laughs> like what? Talented. Yeah. I heard he can't break dance and juggle too. <laughs> Whoa. Which one, David or Steve? I'm, I'm just, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm going along with it. I'm going to spread the rumor. It's Steve. He's the break dancer. Yeah. And juggler, I guess. So hook scenario. him up with a Scott and they can like do it together. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, with Scott, Scott uh, do, yeah, doing the break dancing. So why don't we talk about since since we're kind of um, echoing a little bit of the Jam Stack that that we're discussing here, and it's an easy transition. Why don't we talk about what you're doing now? And I don't know if you're currently with uh, uh, the same company, but because mm -hmm. the title that I have is different, is now you are, and maybe it, maybe that's what it was all the time, developer experience engineer. Do you mind yeah. talking about what that is and what your day to day is like and where you're working at? Yeah, for sure. So um, I am a developer experience engineer at Netlify, and Netlify is a company that allows you to run static site deployments really easily. Um, and so most people use that particular feature, just the, if you have a site that's built in React or Vue or Angular, um, and you essentially have a build that it allows it to build to like a single page app or a static site, um, Netlify is able to do that for you and it hosts all the static assets on the CDN. So it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, and so that's like the crux of the, the product. And there's other like corollary stuff to it, like serverless functions and um, forms, which allows you to do like forms without having a backend, et cetera. And so I work on the developer experience team, which means that my role is to try to ease the onboarding of all of those features as much as possible. So I try to pick pinpoint um, developer pain points and figure out what exactly are things that people struggle with and what people have challenges with, and then figure out a way to make that a bit smoother so that whether that be creating a CLI or creating a library or creating templates. And sometimes that involves like content, blog posts, videos, whatever, to just like fill any knowledge gaps people have with using the product. And then of course, there's a lot of like talk about Jamstack because that's like a huge thing that um, Netlify is, is advocating just the, the whole decoupling of front end and back end so that you build 
in a scalable fashion rather than building like a dynamic like a full-on monolithic application that takes a lot of servers and cost and etc yeah so that's like in a nutshell what i do <laughs> and i guess day to day it's it changes a lot because um the role is very different from what you would think uh an engineer is so in general engineering roles or traditional engineering roles your um you have a product manager you're essentially working on a product of some form so you have a product product manager and a project manager and they essentially will break down specific tasks that you're working on so you're like i'm working on this particular feature and these are the various tasks and then you talk as a team on like what exactly you're building so it's very specific and it's very much like these are the things i need to do and at every single point in time you know what you're working towards for us um our vision or the mission is essentially to try to uh, support developers on the platform. And that's a very intangible thing, um, which means that we often, uh, we, every week have to assess what our priorities are. So sometimes our priorities are building build plugins. Like if we have access to, or if we expose a part of the build system to developers, we want them to build on top of it. How are we going to encourage them to do that? And then we need to figure out, like, create blog posts, create plugins of our own so people see what we're doing and all that kind of stuff. And then on another time when we're launching a specific feature, like, let's say back, back a couple of years when we launched serverless functions, we needed to show people how to use serverless functions on the platform, which involved, like, writing a bunch of functions, writing demos, giving talks, writing content, just all of that, and flooding developers with all sorts of like information on how exactly to use that feature. So it's, again, it depends a lot on what we're working on. And so like day to day, it's very different. Um, so it's really hard to say like, this is my day <laughs> and this is how it is. Of course, uh, like me as a person, I have routines that I do, which like kind of add structure to my day, but that's like outside of Netlify <laughs> and more like a personal thing, just to be like, how do you work from home? And these are the things that you do to do that, yeah. So what do you, how, what are, what is your work from home uh, pattern? Like you have any yeah. advice? It's, it's a good time to give advice like that. For sure. So. For sure. Yeah. So um, yeah, uh, generally I try to wake up at, at a certain time every day. I mean, it depends because sometimes I wake up at seven or eight, depending on whether I slept late the night before. Um, and then for me to have a productive day, it's actually, I found very important to work out in the morning. <laughs> I know people who don't and because they don't like it and that works for them, it does not work for me. Um, and mainly because I need to get like my endorphins up in the morning so I'm not as groggy. Because I think sometimes in the morning, specifically in the winter, I mean, you're in Florida, but in the winter. Hey, this here, winter here. It's 90 in the winter yes. here, which is, whew, that's cold. Well, I mean, so. it's- We 50. have a full day of winter. Come on, let's be fair. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, but it's, it's like 50 now, so it's not too bad, but generally it's, it hovers around 30. So and nice. it gets yeah so it gets pretty like dark and cold and depressing in the mornings oh, like generally great. and the evenings yeah I, I think yeah it depends if you live in it every day it kind of becomes a drag but um yeah so in order to fight the general winter lag that's like my morning routine of like just wake up work out shower get dressed what do you do for your workout? Are you are you going for a jog, then hitting the gym? What do you do? What's your routine? Uh, I usually hit the gym. I hate running. I absolutely hate running. Uh, yeah. Same. Same. Yeah. It's just, so I, I have done it before and I have actually, it's not that I can't run, I can. Uh, I have done like five and 10 Ks and longer before, but it's just, yeah. In, especially in a city, you're running on concrete. It's really hard on your knees. And um, I think for me to get into that runner zone that everyone talks about, I have to do a 5k. I can't do anything less. And that takes like 30 minutes. And it's like getting to that 5k takes a while. But once I hit it, I'm like in that focus mode, but I just don't care enough to get there <laughs> half the time. Just like, that's a lot of commitment to get to that point. So I'd rather do anything else. Also, it never feels like a workout to me. It just feels like I tire myself and then that's, that's it. So uh, yeah, it's a lot of like calisthenics type workout because I climb a lot. So I try to supplement with just like strength training, but not with weights. Because I think 
the problem with weight sometimes is that you use too heavy a weight and then you injure yourself. So I think with, with just body weight, the likelihood of you injuring yourself is lower. So I generally do that because it's just like easier also. You don't need equipment. You can do it at home. Like now I don't have access to gym, so I can just do that at home. So that's really easy. Yeah. So that's like sort of, <laughs> sort of what I do. Well, also, yeah. you know, with, with what you do specifically rock climbing, I guess we could, we could jump into that. You don't yeah. want, uh, you don't want to lift a lot of weights cause you don't want to gain a lot of mass, a lot of muscle mass. You wouldn't be light, but strong. Like you want to have that's core fair. and you want to have, at least from my understanding, cause I, I'm, I'm not, no expert in rock climbing. He's but bullshitting for, right now. He has no idea. <laughs> from my experience watching, um, uh, what is it? American Ninja Warrior, Sarah. Thank mm-hmm. you. Sorry. Is, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm an avid watcher. You, you gain a lot of, you, you want to gain a lot of core and wrist, wrist strength. That mm-hmm. That's the, the, the main crux of it, I guess. I don't know. You, you, you would be able to speak to that better, obviously. I, I yeah go ahead no no go, go. no I, I I actually don't so I I'm not sure about the gains part because um like I can only as a woman build as much mass as like I can't go over a specific threshold like I'll build mass and then you threshold after a while um and so I'm not worried about that that's like something I'm not worried about because I know climbers who actually do weight training and they're like pro climbers um but for me it's just purely like the convenience of weights because I don't have weights and also like generally I think I sometimes can get overzealous like I just assume I'm like oh I can do 40 pound kettlebell swings that's easy and then the next day I'm broken yeah, so yeah you're just, back <laughs> yeah. so I'm like it's easier if you do like I think also in terms of recovery if you do like calisthenics your recovery doesn't feel as brutal as if you just lifted a bunch of heavy weights so like injuries lower recovery is much smoother yeah. So I think that's the main reason for me. Um, yeah. I kind of like it too. Cause I feel like you're, you're exercising for your body, not for yeah. something that's not your body. Like yeah. I don't carry around a 50 pound weight. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Oh, exactly. like we weren't, when we were uh, developed on Mars for the Martians, we didn't naturally lift weights around. We were just people. And yeah. That makes sense. All right. Um, <laughs> so uh, confused. What, what, okay. A nerve there, Brian? Yeah. <laughs> what 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 about the, your your work from home? I'm curious. As the day, do you always set a cutoff point? Uh, that's one thing I'm always like. Mm-hmm. Oh, I try and do that. I try and like I'm yeah. always done at this time. But of course, it doesn't always work out that way. But what what do you what is your routine like? Yeah, I think the cutoff point is really important because like otherwise your day just extends. So when I started yeah. working from home, uh, my job at Nellify was the first time I worked from home. And that was like a year and a half ago. So like July of 2018. And that was really hard because I just assumed, I assumed when I started that I wouldn't work hard enough, but I ended up working too hard uh, because I just started the day in the morning and then the day just extended into the evening and I just kept working and like answering emails and whatever. And so now there's like general cutoff points where I'm like, you know, after like 6 p.m. Central Time or whatever, I'll be like, okay, just force myself not to check email unless I really have to. Like if someone DMs me and it looks important, then I'm like, okay, let me answer it. But in general, I think there isn't an expectation that you're working all the time. I think one of the things that is kind of interesting is I really like working with my team a lot. Like I like it. I love all of them. They're wonderful people. And so sometimes I'm DMing them. Like we have a group like channel and so we'll be on there like really late at night, mainly because we want to hang out and talk to each other. And that's like what we do. So we're not working. We're just like talking about other things, but we're on Slack anyway. Like I won't be answering other things that are happening. Like if someone else is yeah. messaging about something else, but I'll be like chatting with them. So it's kind of weird because we don't have like a separate group thread on a different messaging channel. So we end up on Slack. Um, but I still don't consider consider that work really because I'm like I'm still just like you know it's like when you go out to beers with coworkers or whatever and you're chatting yeah you chatting with buddies yeah exactly so yeah but I think it's really important to have that cut off mainly because otherwise yeah it's it's really unhealthy to just continue working endlessly and I'm I'm a guilty of that where sometimes I get really engrossed in the task 
and then I just keep walking and I'm like I just have one more thing I just have one more thing and then it's like 9 p.m and you're like oh so you know, yeah yeah you know, what I what I've done in the, like in the past of that is if I end up working more than like like say I say I end at three and I work another hour like what I've done previously um and the work has been okay with it is I like I say hey I worked an extra hour I'm gonna start an hour late and let everyone know and see if there's any conflicts yeah. but uh, do you do anything similar or yeah I've been trying to do more of that so that happens a lot with um specifically with um conferences I mean not now not so much but because we're all not traveling but when I am on the road there are times when an event happens on the weekend so I did a for instance a, it was a student hackathon at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign that was on it started on Friday night and it went till Sunday mid-afternoon and so I went down there on Saturday because it's about a two like a two and a half to three hour Amtrak ride from Chicago and so I went down on a Saturday I pretty much just spent Saturday there <laughs> I didn't spend the entire time and then I I went down Saturday morning and came back to Chicago Saturday evening. So my entire Saturday was like a student hackathon. And I, and I think I was talking to my manager and she was like, take the day, take the day, one of the days next week off, just because like you essentially worked an extra day. Um, Cause I was talking to students about Netlify and JavaScript and various other things. So it's essentially sort of work. Um, and so, yeah, th that is encouraged. It's, it's generally like, no one's going to push you to do it. It's very, you have to be motivated to do that. And so <laughs> I think it's encouraged. Like people will tell you, or some, some of my team members will give, give, will give each other shit if, you know, we work longer and we're still <laughs> in a meeting and we're like, you should take time off, just go. Yeah. Um, so that's really nice. Yeah, my, my experience is the same. I think a lot of people that have worked, have, have you worked remote for a long time? Um, only a year and a half. Okay. So yeah, yeah. I've, I've been remote like five ish years, something like that. So I don't even like in the beginning, I worried about when do I start and when do I stop and what's my routine. And now for me, it's much more fluid. I think it also depends where you work. Um, so uh, like 60% of my companies is, is, uh, is distributed and everybody else is in San Francisco. And so um, I mean, right now everyone's distributed, obviously, but um, typically what I will do is I'll start later um, in the morning. Like, so I'll take the morning for myself because no one's up until noon my time anyway. And then I do my meetings because I know I'm probably going to be in meetings later in the day. Um, and it's basically, you know, for me, it's like a uh, give and take. Like some days I'll work a little bit later. So then the next day I take it away um, by starting later or by ending earlier or something like that. Um, but I don't, I don't really stress myself out about it. Like as long as I feel good and I don't feel like I'm like working myself to death. I just kind of go with the flow. So. Yeah, I like yeah. that you inform your coworkers of your work hours too. So like we yeah. have coworkers that are on different time zones, like not just within the US, but uh, one of my coworkers, Phil, Ho Phil Hawksworth, lives in London and that's like six hours for ahead of Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> and so oftentimes when meetings happen at regular US hours, it's really late for him. And so what he ends up doing is he ends up starting the day late and ending late. Yep. So he moves his hours a little. So there's some overlap. Like it's not crazy, but yeah. there is some overlap. And he informs us like these are the hours that yep. I'm available. Yep. And that way it's like you can be sure of like I'm only working within this time frame and also people know when to expect you. Yeah. Yeah. And then people don't feel bad because I find actually people really care about not bothering their their distributed coworkers in different time zones. And so by me saying, Hey, listen, it's no problem. Like I started at noon. So a meeting at 6 p.m. is absolutely fine. That's still in my, my window of, of the, the eight-hour day. Um, and it kind of makes people feel better about, about setting meetings and just more comfortable. Um, so, yeah, it's cool to can be I, so flexible. Go. Can I append to that? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, one of the things I heard a long time ago was you, you train people how you want to be treated. So if you are answering Slack messages at 11 o'clock all the time thinking, oh, you know what, I'm going to put in that extra, you know, oof. like that, that's how people are going to just assume like, well, you always do that and it will result in you always doing that. What do you, what do you think about that? Like making sure that you set um, respectable boundaries 
for your work hours and, and, and your expectations? I'm about boundaries in all areas of my life. So yes, plus one on that. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying for people that are probably not used to remote now and yeah. we have so many people currently rem remote that they're, they're looking for like ways of how should I do this? How should I yeah. behave? What's appropriate? Um, I might be nervous about it. I, I don't know what I'm doing. Should I work around the clock? But yeah, setting boundaries and expectations, making sure that you take care of your own mental health so you're able to do what you need to do at work. Like, wasn't there a, a recent study in, um, I think, I, oh man, I think it was IBM that was doing this where they were reducing hours from 40 to, they were doing a, a, a four day work week and they found that people were even way more productive and they're getting even more results doing stuff like that. Anybody yeah, hear think, about that? Study? I think I've seen, I've seen that study being done in various places or like people talking about that. Um, and yeah, generally there is a high success rate that people do uh, end up being more productive when the hours are shorter because you don't have a lot of time. So you end up just like actually <laughs> making that time count, which is really cool. But I think um, to all the points that we made, it's like very important to like have a routine and all of these things for working from home. But I think we are in a very strange <laughs> moment of working from home. Like this is not a normal sense of working from home that we're in because like, I know Sarah's done it longer. I've done it for like a year and a half now, but this moment in time feels very surreal compared to other times that I've worked from home. I feel yeah. generally that productivity is way lower because everyone is just trying to like, okay, this is what's happening. And the constant news cycle of just like yeah. horror, <laughs> things that are happening and you're just like, okay, things are getting worse and worse. Like, I have that GIS data map uh, open constantly. <laughs> so I've seen this. Yeah. Oh, I'm just like, oh, just God. looking for the damage report. Yeah, I find oh, I yeah. find uh, myself on Twitter a lot, uh, yeah. looking at stuff, and uh, yeah, I, I I try and just turn it, just completely close it, mute all notifications, don't look at it, because otherwise I'm like, oh my God, it's the end. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to it's hard to have. Um, I think it's really common that everyone. I mean, me included, that there's this sense, this like a, this existential dread of what's happening with what's happening. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's really important to just no note that that is normal and we are living in a not normal world at this Wait, point. Wait, the dread is normal? <laughs> yeah, the dread, the dread is normal. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, I think it's normal. Yeah, if people are like, oh, yeah, well, this is you said this is fine. It's like that dog in that like burning house. Yes. Kind of thing. Oh yeah, this is fine. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I'm just like, no, it's not fine. It's not, it's fine. not fine. Everything is kind of going insane right now. And so like yeah. I've had, I, I think my manager reached out to all of us and was like, hey, if you're having a difficult time, like take time because I have coworkers, like I, I don't have like a family or anything. So I have nothing to worry about from that aspect. But I have coworkers whose kids are home and yeah. I can't even imagine the difficulty of just trying to maintain decorum at work and productive and being productive. And then also having to manage like a five-year-old <laughs> who needs like attention all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like yeah. how crazy is that? It's just insane. I could tell you yeah. it's crazy because I have a five-year-old who needs attention all the time. And, you know, my wife and I are having a difficult time trying to, you know, explain things such as, oh, we can't go to jump and fun or we can't go and see our friends because there's uh, there's a bad cold going around. And, you know, he, all he wants to do is go out and see his friends and hang out with everyone. And, um, you know, thank God for things like Netflix. But it's 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 still it's, it's a really difficult time right now for everyone. And luckily, I believe that everyone is. Um, kind of understanding that and giving each other space like we might not have the same level of productivity obviously with what we're all doing because we're 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 all really stressed out and we have real lives and um but you know we'll get through it hopefully yeah it helps to have a manager i know for me personally my my management executives like everybody has reached out and said like we understand that this is not normal and that you're you're not going to be as productive and that's okay like they've acknowledged that because um i mean i'm 
borderline workaholic, I think, maybe, probably. So for me, borderline. when I don't, so when I, when I feel like I'm not, you know, doing my best, I, I, it really becomes this kind of like terrible cycle of like, oh, I'm not doing as good as I should and I should do better. And then I get anxious about it and then just becomes this thing. And sometimes just giving people permission to like be kind to themselves and, and not, you know, um, hold themselves to this unbelievable standard when it's kind of insane to uh, is really nice. So I definitely appreciate that from my management. It's been, it's been really nice. I just yeah, saw an interesting, um, sorry to interrupt you, Brian. I, I just wanted to say, I saw an interesting thing from uh, somebody on the live chats, Daniel Walt, Waltz, I believe is how you say his name. Uh, he feels like he's even more, pro his productivity is even more up because uh, work is a good distraction. Uh, that's that's a fair statement Positive. for some people, right? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I need to get into that zone. Uh, I don't know how. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, that kind of makes sense. I mean, I've, I've yeah. found that I, there's been times like, like today, I, you get in the zone, you just like completely phase out every, everything. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say too, my, my company gave everyone uh, additional 10 days of PTO to use as as they please and they actually my manager said that you know if you have kids or you need time for that do take the time off and i, I think definitely more companies should consider doing that yeah, i think it's oh yeah. should be kind That's of expected nice. that we well, yeah, have everyone's kids that are at home too it's not like you're working remote normally where your kid yeah. might be in daycare or at school, school. it's mm -hmm. like it, that's that doesn't exist there's no school in daycare so yeah yeah, that's a very valid point. It's it's difficult. Again, having a five year old, I, I could tell you, um, you know, uh, luckily I, I I could work remote, and you know, my my wife's taking the time off, and um, you know, there there's nothing else we could do. It's 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 a challenge, but like I said, we'll we'll all get through. It's all temporary, and we just have to remind ourselves and the ones around us that we're going to get through this, and as all things, it will pass. This is really morose. Let's switch topics. <laughs> <laughs> rock switch climbing. Up. Exactly, rock climbing. <laughs> Jake, how, how did you climbing? get into that? How did you get no, into rock yeah. climbing? Um, so did I, you pick up a rock one day and you're like, I'm going to climb this thing? <laughs> no. I, <laughs> I, it's actually really simply, I, I moved to Ohio um, after college and uh, didn't know anyone because I had moved like by myself, essentially, like across from Massachusetts all the way. And so um, I lived across from a rock climbing gym and I needed to like meet people. <laughs> so I started climbing the end. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's that works. It. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, that seems like such an awesome way. Like my problem with running is that I'm running and I'm thinking of all the other things I could be doing. Yeah. Now, if I'm cleaning my house and, and which I take very seriously and I'm, you know, I'm like pulling everything out and moving everything back and like it, I get so engrossed in the, or like my mind is occupied. Mm -hmm. I would think that maybe rock climbing is similar because you obviously have to really be thinking strategically about where you're going and what you're doing yeah. and you're getting exercise. Yeah, I think it's, it hits a lot of the, the like the nice parts of that. Like it is a physical activity and it is like aspects of problem solving because you have to like figure out how exactly you need to move to get to the top. Yeah. Um, but there's also like the social aspect of it, which I, which I really like. Cause you get to meet people and like talk to people and work with a work on a problem with them. And so it's, it's really cool. It's um, it fulfills so many categories of like what I want in my life. Um, and also uncannily, it's also just a activity that seems to draw a lot of software engineers. Just like every rock climber I meet at the gym is likely a software engineer <laughs> of some form. And so it ends up like, Oh, I need a hobby where, of people who don't do tech and then i go do this hobby <laughs> everyone does tech anyway like okay well but at least you have something that gets you away from the screen you know it's important yeah, to have yeah. that like forced away from a screen and it's mm -hmm. it's just you're doing that like sarah yeah. was talking about like having something like i, I don't want to say that i'm comparing you know cleaning your house to, to rock climbing but it, it it's very similar in the uh respect to what Sarah was saying, it's something that you're doing physically uh, that gets you out of out of your head, where you have to think about something completely different to what you're doing. That's the big thing to me is getting out of my own head because I'm always yeah. in there and I just cannot 
wait to get away from myself. And I find things like running or monotonous things like that. Just, it's like, it, it, it's even worse. I'm like in an echo chamber of, of physical pain and listening to myself complain about it and I can't do it. So do you, do you only climb at the gym? I mean, do you go, or do you go and actually like go? I've and done, climb yeah. I've done outdoors too. Like it's indoors and outdoors. So scares like, me. they're slightly different in terms of like <laughs> the way you climb. So like indoor climbing, obviously is like, it's pretty safe. You can still break yeah. things like if you mess up. Um, and I've seen that happen. Um, but outdoors, there's like so many variables. Um, one, you also have to have a, a ton of gear on you because essentially you're climbing rock and you need to place gear and you need to do all kinds of safety checks. Um, but there is the adventure aspect to it, which is really nice. So it's an extra bonus because when you're in the gym, it's just a gym and you get the social thing, you get the exercise. But um, when you are outdoors, you get a bit of the adventure because there is some hiking because you hike into wherever the route is. So there's yeah. some of that, which is really cool. And then when you do climb, you get gorgeous views on the top. So there's like that dopamine rush when you end up finishing a route. Um, and like there's camping involved as well, because generally that's what happens when you're outdoors. You hike and you camp. So there's a lot of like that sort of outdoorsy aspect to it. So some people really like it. Like I like it. Um, others not so much so I have friends who are just gym climbers um, and that's perfectly fine but yeah it's it is very different so when you're outdoors you climb a lower level than you usually like you don't go as hard <laughs> or at least for me I know people yeah. who have who do climb harder but I don't just purely for like safety because I'm like I don't want to climb too hard and then mess up or whatever but yeah it's um it's definitely nice. The downside to Chicago is that it's pretty flat. <laughs> so, uh, most of the Midwest is pretty flat. And Florida so too. <laughs> you have to go pretty far to, to hit mountains. I mean, you can go up to Wisconsin. There's a couple of places there. Um, and then for longer trips, like go down to Kentucky. Like have, you been to, an hour. have you been to Utah? Have you done anything out there? I have not. I have not. So the one time I wanted to, uh, it rained. So I couldn't do it. I was out there. Like a friend just moved out there and we were going to climb, but it rained that day. So. Uh, I spent yeah. some time in Moab and um, my husband and I like to, to hike. Um, I'm definitely afraid of heights. I'm, I'm okay, yeah. like if I'm far enough away. Um, but I mean, there was like this one where I had to literally lay down and like like army crawl over because it was too terrifying. Um, but I saw a lot of people climbing um, things that I thought like as a mom were, was very dangerous and I was concerned for their <laughs> well-being. Um, <laughs> but it did look awesome. It looked really cool. Yeah, Utah has some really good climbing. So does Colorado and California. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've I, yeah, I've done both indoor and outdoor. And indoor, the thing I liked, it, I like about indoor is you know where the handles are. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know you know where to grab, um, and and if you're an outdoor, you might get hit by lightning. Oh, well, lightning! And since I mentioned lightning, <gasps> hey, why don't we go into the lightning round? Oh, oh my god, <laughs> the cheesiest segue ever. <laughs> Awful. Speaking of cheesy, yeah. Sarah was just talking. Brian, back to you. Oh my god, shut up. What? <laughs> um, yeah, so we're getting towards the end of the show, so we, li we like to do a, a little uh, lightning round of questions uh, where we all ask you a question, we answer it in succession, uh, just random question could be about food, could be about something we, we, we didn't ask during the show. So Frederick will kick it off, right, Frederick? What is your favorite cartoon as a kid? Uh, I really like Looney Tunes. Sarah? Oh, God, it's always me. Um... <laughs> Uh, favorite favorite board game as a kid Ooh, uh, I played um, set a lot does that count as a board game sort of it's a card game yeah um, yeah. Like yeah I really like that that was a cool game I think it ages well too so you can play with older people and younger people as well yeah, yeah. Um, if Mars was livable would you accept a one way ticket there oh uh that's a good question i think it's really hard for me to say yes or no i think it would depend on what infrastructure was on mars okay and what I could Frederick? Say, yeah what is your favorite thing about you about me yeah what's um, your favorite thing about you i think uh 
I think one of the things that I do like is that I, um, I'm so I'm I'm really bad at change, but in a sense I, I like embrace it in a weird sense. Like it takes me a while to adapt, but part of it is that I'm like if something is changing, like I have to move somewhere. I'm pretty good at that. So I, I'm actually very good at moving at this point because I've moved a lot. So I think that's one thing I like about myself, just the ability to like pick up and go somewhere, and then like kind of deal with it. But it takes it takes a while, but yeah, yeah eventually I adjust. Love You're it, adaptable. adaptable um, yeah. Let's see. If you could have a superpower, any any superpower, what would it be? Um, I would like to have the ability to read people's minds. Mm. How? What, oh, what, I, I want to know more. Yeah, yeah, well, okay, what chore do you absolutely hate doing? What chore do I hate doing? Um, probably. That's a hard one. I, I feel like I like doing chores. Um, mopping the floor. All right. Ready? If you couldn't be in front of a computer for the rest of your life, what would you do professionally? Um, yikes. I do everything with a computer. Uh, maybe be, be a journalist where Ooh. I actually have to write instead of type or something. That. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Oh, geez, Louise. I'm terrible at this. Can you tell? Um, <laughs> Give me more time. It's fine. <laughs> I, have, I have a list. He has a list. I just like try to make the stuff up as I go. I need to get I myself like a list. I need to get myself a list. Um, mm, chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Would you rather be able to copy and paste in real life or undo in real life? Undo. Okay. Right picture this you come home it's late at night i mean late at night it is storming outside you can barely get the key in the door right you're like soaked and you're yeah. like oh my god i just want to get in the house and grab a cup of tea and just chill the fuck out you see a ghost what do you do run all right <laughs> Sarah? Sarah. Do, do you believe in ghosts i do not no okay, okay. Um, you're in the circus. Would you rather be the person with their head inside the lion's mouth or get shot out of the cannon? Uh, shot out of the cannon. All right. Let me ask you, on uh, a rating system between 1 to 10 uh, and, and uh, 11 being the most acceptable answer, what do you think about this book from Sarah oh Veselov? It's <laughs> called so Building awesome. Design oh, Systems. It's wonderful. I think 11. Oh. 11? Uh, I would <laughs> also give it 11. Building Design okay. System by Sarah Veselov. Go to Amazon today and buy it. Oh my God. Okay, Sarah, your turn. All right. So in a in a in a boxing match, well, in a match between a Yeti and a Sasquatch, who would win? Sasquatch. That's right. What what fact amazes That's you right. every time you think of it? Um, I think the height of the tallest emperor penguin. What music are you listening to right now? Uh, a lot of like chill electronic music. So one of the bands that I really like is called Cigarettes After Sex. It's very chill. And Thievery Corporation, also another good band. Ooh, Old yes. but good. Yeah. Yes. What is the height of the tallest emperor penguin? I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like... I forget exactly what it is. Like every time I always forget it, and then I learn about it. Hold on, tallest. I have things um, like that where I amaze myself over and over again. It's very. Yeah, satisfying. I'm always like, wait, what is it? <laughs> and it's it's really it's like six foot eight or something like that. What? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. That's yeah, that's true. I always learn it. I always forget, and then I read it again, and I'm. I like, thought you were what? gonna say like four foot eight or no, something. No, like six okay. Foot eight. Yeah, it's like oh. tallest. Taller than like the average American male, oh, which is not the tall, but like yeah. So <laughs> not the tall. <laughs> what what's what's one pet peeve of yours that you wish that you could get rid of because it just hampers your enjoyment of life? I think um, like feeling bad for like whatever reason, just like feeling bad for saying something or, or feeling like I I hurt someone's feelings. Or, yeah. What podcast are you listening to right now right now um i'm listening to a lot of radio lab it's very oh, like chill yeah. 
story story time kind of thing. I learn new things every time. 99% Invisible is also a really good one because I learn like about various cool architectural things. Um, and he has a very soothing voice. Mm-hmm. Is this the last question? The last question. Last question. What is your favorite Radio Lab episode? I have to know. What is my favorite one? Oh, there's so many. I have I two favorites. I feel like I'm on the spot right now. Hold on. You are. That's the whole up. point. <laughs> um, there. I really liked when they did the Dolly Parton like series. Those were cool because I had no idea, for instance, that Dolly Parton was so well loved across, mm-hmm. like cross culturally. I think she's that amazing. was a new. Yeah, I, I just yeah. assumed she was well, like she was a she's a country singer. I was just like, whatever, Dolly Parton, known for known within America, American country singer music lovers. But apparently she has a very wide audience and she yep. brings all these people together and yep. it's just amazing. Yeah. She always manages to stay neutral too with everything. Yeah. She's just like, no, I'm Dolly. Yeah. <laughs> Dolly. I was like, I think I think when I listened to that radio, I was like, holy. Like, I'm just yeah. So yeah, we saw her last year. She's still amazing live. She's yeah, you saw her live? Show. I'm jealous. Yeah. Should be. Just last year? That's so cool. Yeah, that's great. Hmm. Uh, well, um, we're getting to the end. Uh, we like to offer our audience or our guest at and uh, an opportunity to say any kind of um, parting words, any kind of uh, thing you want to tell to the audience? That I should tell them? Um, well, yeah, any, any kind of words of wisdom you like to share at the end? I think, I think just to like chill and everything will be all right. Considering we talked a lot about like doom and gloom, like, mm-hmm. it's going to be all right. Nice. And uh, what's the best way people could find out more about you? Yeah, so I am on Twitter at shortdiv, and that's generally like the most public channel that I'm on. Um, I also have a website called shortdiv.com. I think generally the one, the thing that updates the most is Twitter, <laughs> not my blog. Um, and so that's probably the best channel to like find out more about me or hear from me. Yeah. No, I said, I know we didn't really uh, touch on this, but I love the, the story that you told on our podcast about how uh, you got the name from, um, what was it, somebody in high school that said, uh, yeah. there's two of you and you're the short one? Yeah, that's like, essentially, it's very simply just, I was the shorter <laughs> Divya. So, but it stuck. It's like now a, a name. And it, and it worked. Yeah. With your career. So For sure. Yeah. It's like a, it's like rapper call sign. I'm just going to keep it. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you yeah. for being on the show and taking the time with us. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming back. Really appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. This is fun. Cool. Mm, awesome. Thanks. Love hearing that. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thanks everybody for watching. Really appreciate it. And uh, Shelton, I want to see that CSS. You, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, take care, everybody. <laughs>